and welcome back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Arctic Fire 2012, here we are. Uh, we're having more fun than we can uh, describe on this. I wish you guys could see all the behind the scenes stuff. We're actually t talking about putting together a, a DVD which captures some of those things. But I think as good as the presentations are, the really good stuff, unfortunately, at this point is happening off camera. So we're going to try and get uh, uh, guys walking around with cameras later. Uh, Later today, we're probably going to be doing some just some forging. Um, uh, Michael Pakula is going to prepare some pieces for his demonstration tomorrow. So we'll have some uh, open forge, so to speak, and you'll be able to just sit in and listen on that. We'll just have cameras up on tripods. Uh, so uh, at any rate, I'm here to introduce Jake Pounding, uh, who is a extremely talented uh, bladesmith. Um, I was just absolutely blown away. But when I first got back into bladesmithing, I took a 10-year hiatus or so, um, I found bladesmithsforum.com, and one of the first threads that just absolutely blew me away, nearly fell out of my chair, was a collaborative effort that he did um, uh, called the Black Ool Jake. There's a funny name, funny story about that name, I'll tell you later. Uh, but at any rate, uh, his work is incredibly inspirational, and he's doing groundbreaking work with using the sword as a way of telling a story. You can almost see the story when you look at the sword. They're really inspirational pieces, and uh, this is a good demo. I've looked forward to this ever since we came up with the idea of Arctic Fire. So take it away, Jake. Great, thanks. You bet. Um, all right, so I'll start my story. My demo is called The Storyteller's Tongue, Myth, Imagination, and the Art of Creating Artifacts. So I'm going to start out by just familiarizing you with a chronology of some of my work. Um, this is a piece I made, the first piece that I made um, out of uh, pattern welded steel uh, when I was about 19 years old and uh, inspired by Celtic mythology. mythology. It's kind of got the forest god on the handle um, in 1997. Um, this is a piece that was with the first composite pattern molded sword that I made uh, in 2003. And you can see at this point I'd started incorporating handle carving and uh, using um, Viking Age knotwork in the, in the design um, as a decorative element. Um, this is the first piece that I got some, started to get recognition internationally with, uh, and it was at um, the Macau Museum of Art in China, along with work from a, a number of other smiths, including Peter Johnson, who's here today. Um, uh, this is another uh, piece that I made around that time um, out of Woots from a fellow named Greg Thomas Obash from Ontario. He came to my forge with this huge chunk of metal. Uh, and he was, at first I was talking with him and he was saying, he was like, you know, you should really, have you ever thought about working with Woots? And I was like, I'm, I'm never going to work with Woots. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. And then he gave me this huge chunk of woots, uh, and I, so then I kind of ate my words and made a sword out of woots. And uh, oh, sorry, woots is is a crucible steel. That's uh, uh, an ancient um, kind of Middle Eastern way of making making um, making steel by melting it in a pot, and you you create this this uh, homogeneous material that has a really beautiful pattern in the in the steel. So you can see in this image here. Um, if you look closely, you can see this kind of beautiful dendritic structure, and it's actually the this, the pattern of the dendrites in in the material. Um, so this is a a falchion that I made that was exploring uh, some kind of mythological ideas. Um, this is the black old Jake that was mentioned earlier. So this is a collaboration that I did with a German smith uh, named Uli Haneke. And uh, he asked me if I would like to make a scabbard and hilt for this sword um, in an email. And uh, so we started working together, and, and uh, I, cr I created the, the, the fittings out of bronze and carved the scabbard and handle out of this beautiful chunk of bog oak, which is oak that's been submerged in a bog for uh, 3,000 years, and it turns black as night, and it's just beautiful and also f kind of... It's a fascinating material to work with from a, a storytelling perspective because it existed in, it's this ancient piece of, of, um, of wood from Europe, which is where I'm making the, 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 where the work is inspired from this ancient European culture. So it's a, an, an interesting material to work with. Um, 
This is another falchion from 2007. Um, I was playing with this same little uh, cutout on the back of the blade. Um, and this is a pattern molded sword. I'm going to be describing the process of making a pattern molded sword later in this uh, demonstration. But you can see the pattern in the steel, and that's created by taking a number of separate pieces of metal that, that are made themselves of separate pieces of metal and forge welding them together in a bundle and then creating a blade out of it. But I'll, I'll explain that later. Um, this is a moon steel blade that was inspired by um, conversations that we had on the, the forums of the Bladesmiths Forum. A uh, group of us were, were talking about making making uh, steel by the light of the moon and Taigu, who is a bladesmith, uh, did the first moon steel blade. Um, and so I started forging a blade but only by the light of the moon. Um, and there's a picture of me working. And I went over a year to make the steel for it. So once at one night every month. Um, and this is out in the winter in a snowbank forging. Uh, there I am posing for the camera. <laughs> so I made, and this handle and scabbard are also made out of bog oak. Um, and it's kind of mysterious and black. And, and then I used silver like moonlight for the fittings. And I created a, a box for this one and named it Manigander, which is, Mani is the ancient Germanic word for the man in the moon. And Gander is a word that means magic or magic wand. So it's it, it's a reference to this kind of a ma moon moon blade or moon moon wand. Um, and this is Torque Triath. This is a Celtic inspired sword with a, a composite pattern molded blade. Um, one of the things that's really important for me in my work is the naming process of naming a sword is a big part of the storytelling um, element of that sword. So this sword was an exploration of, of uh, Celtic mythology, and it was I was trying to uh, create a sword that was a reference to uh, Bridget, who was also a, a saint, but she, before that she was a goddess in, in uh, Celtic mythology, and Torque Triath was her, her magical boar. So... This is a piece, and originally I designed it with a picture of Bridget on it, and but th that's not how Celtic ornamentation worked. They, they were very, uh, it's very fluid and open to interpretation. So you can see at the top of the scabbard, there's kind of a, a face that looks a little bit like a boar face. Um, and I'm going to show you some other, some of the inspiration that I, I drew from for that piece. Um, this is also a Celtic piece. They had these little short um, swords with the a little man for the handle called anthropomorphic hilted swords and it's called Fürbeg, which means little man in Irish. Um, and the scabbard is carved in this beautiful Litten period curvilinear ornamentation. Um, and I think this one is either from Lisna Kroger or the River Ban, but there were these beautiful um, flowing ornamentation from that period that I'm very inspired by. Um, and this is called Du Sith, which means dark elf. And it was a sword that I made for a fairy that I met. But uh, <laughs> he, th this is actually inspired from handling swords at the Victoria and Albert Museum with, with uh, Don Fogg and, and Peter Johnson and Owen Bush and a number of other people. Um, and there were these incredible dueling swords. And I think they were from the 1500s, weren't they? And they're very light and they move beautifully. So this sword was really about exploring the balance of, of those swords and also some of the things that I learned from um, listening to Peter Johnson talk about the balance of swords. And so this piece, when you hold it, you, you understand the sword, it moves so the tip stays still. And uh, when you move it, holding it near the hilt. Um, so, and I have, the, the other thing about this sword is it has little, little monks inset in the pommel. Um, which is a reference to some swords from that period. Um, so now I'm going to talk. Ab I'm going to go through a chronology of inspiration, and this is basically about the history of ornamentation in Western and Northern Europe, and it's spe specifically referring. I'm, I'm going to show some swords, but it's specifically referring to how what we what we think of as Celtic art now what the roots of that tradition are and how it, it, it grew and how I've gone from, when I started out, I was interested in, uh, in Celtic not work and, and all things Celtic. Uh, and I went back to the Latin period, which is the period when the Celts actually were a, an, an integral culture that, that, uh, that, that, that existed as this vibrant culture in Europe. Um, 
and they had this amazing um, ornamentation style, which is the first, um, the the first really amazing non non classical art in Europe, um, and it started around the fifth century uh, BCE, and it it really flowered in Ireland at around the third century, um, so. This is a crown called the Petri crown on the top. It's about 15 centimeters high. And you can see how this uh, ornamentation is like the ends of the spirals are like little goose heads. Um, and on the right, you can see it looks almost like a little boat with a cross in the center. But it's very, it's very fluid. And sometimes things repeat and sometimes they repeat but aren't quite the same. So it's, a, it's this very intuitive, beautiful ornamentation. Um, and on the bottom you see, a, this is the end of a trumpet um, that they would have, it might have been a war trumpet. So they, they would blow these and they would make this great blaring noise to frighten their enemies. Um, and you can see that the ornamentation is fold over symmetrical. So if you look at the top and the bottom, they're like, um, they're identical to each other. Um, and these are, these are repoussé, uh, so they're, they're hammered out of sheet bronze. Um, these are the f these are, these are drawings of scabbards from Lisna Kroger, Ireland, and in County Antrim, I think, and the River Ban. And the, this this is really exemplary of the the ornamentation from Ireland. It's very beautiful, flowing lines. And the thing that's amazing about this is it it took me a surprisingly long time to realize that I always imagined that these were incredibly complex repoussé that they were hammered out of sheet. And when I would imagine them, but they're just scratches on metal. It's sheet metal with scratches on them. And uh, but it's just such a beautiful repetitive pattern. And if you look at the the, the scabbards, that's the second from the left. That design in particular follows through. You'll see that design continue on, the, this kind of repeating spirals. They, that continues through, through the change of craftsmanship and culture throughout, especially in Britain, um, until the Middle Ages. So just to give you an idea, this is the kind of house that the, the, the Le Ten period Celts lived in 2,300 years ago. So that gives you an idea to when it was. This was 2,300 years ago. Um, and they lived in these, like, basically um, a, a wicker house with a thatched roof in little tiny settlements. They're, they're a tribal society. Um, but they had this incredibly vibrant material culture. Basically... Um, a, a wicker house with a thatched roof in little tiny settlements. They're, they're a tribal society. Um, but they had this incredibly vibrant material culture. And they were so wealthy that they were able to make things that were votive offerings to give to river spirits. And so in this image, you'll see this shield, um, I believe, was found in the river with them. And it was given as an offering. It's actually a miniature shield. So it was constructed specifically to throw in a river. And it's absolutely, I mean, the amount of craftsmanship that went into this object is stunning. And then it was taken and thrown in a river. So as, a, as an offering to the river goddess, or we don't really know what the, why they did that, but obviously it was some kind of a votive uh, situation. Um, and on the right, this is a spearhead from uh, Glen Kerrigbach in Wales, and that's actually from Anglesey, where the Druids lived, and where, where the the Romans actually ended up getting getting rid of the Druids, who were the intellectual class of the Celts. Um, the Romans ended up kind of putting an end to Celtic society eventually because they clashed. Romans were this very advanced society that existed in uh, southern Europe, and they came in and took over Gaul and then Britain, um, and then this material culture ceased to exist after, pretty much, after the Romans invaded Britain. Um, and this is a torque. This is a, a, a ring that the, they would wear around their necks. And this is, it's interesting because when you go to a museum and look at these objects, you see them in a photograph and you imagine how big they are. But you don't really have a frame of reference. So my experience of seeing this in a museum is, you see the swords and you're like, what, they're, they're this big. They're like a little knife, they're tiny. But they're just perfectly functional. They're just about the length of a torso, and the handle is just big enough for a hand to fit on. Uh, but then their jewelry is huge. It's just massive. Like that torque that we're looking at now is about an inch in diameter. It's like this big, massive, and it's solid gold, right? And then they would have these armbands that are they're like that big. 
and just so that they, they would have been these really kitted out warriors with this all of this gold and no shirts on and stuff um Anyway, that, that's, that, that's the Celtic society. And this, th this ornamentation tradition, I think, it's so, so strong and beautiful and powerful. I think that that had an influence on, on the, the, the later tradition. But that's the end of Celtic art. That's Celtic art, and there really isn't anything else that could be described as, as completely Celtic after that point. So this is a map that shows Europe, and it's a, it's the spread of iron. Um, but I'm using it here just to describe how big the area that the, the Latin culture existed in was. So on the far right, you'll see that's the, the Black Sea there. Um, the Celtic Latin culture existed from above the Black Sea all the way across Europe to the, the North Sea, and down into the Mediterranean, and into Spain, um, and into Britain and Ireland. So that just gives you an idea of how big this huge, completely decentralized tribal society was, but that had a common material culture. Uh, and then this is a picture of a, this is a sword from Britain. Um, and you can see, uh, I was talking about pattern welded blades. Well, this is kind of a proto pattern welded blade. And what it is, is they were taking iron and, uh, and smelting it. So they would have this kind of not very homogeneous bloom of iron, which is the, 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 the product that you get from smelting ore into iron um, in a little furnace. And then you take that and fold it a bunch of times to make it better so that it, it holds together. Um, but it's very time consuming to fold it and forge weld it. So what they started doing is they took the very finely folded stuff that they had folded a bunch of times to get a more homogeneous piece of material. And they wrapped that around the edge of less homogeneous material. I mean, you look at this picture, you can see that you can see there are little lines running along just in from the edges of the blade. And you can see the nice, very, you can see that the lines are very thin on the edges of the blade. And in the center, it's this, this more kind of almost looks like wood. But the, these swords in Britain, at any rate, they weren't hardened. They were just, they, they, they made them, they, they, they had uh, carbon content that you could have hardened which is you need to have carbon in, in iron to be able to quench it in, in water or oil and make it hard. Um, and they knew how to harden things at this point because we have hard files, but they didn't harden the swords for some reason. Um, these are three swords that I examined at the British Museum with, with Peter Johnson and Owen Bush. Um, and these were these are Latin period anthro hilts, and I've had a, a fantasy about handling these swords my whole life and never imagined that I ever would. Um, and so... I have a little bit later on, I'll get a little bit more about this experience of seeing these blades. Um, so this is a picture of one of the blades with a drawing of it next to it there. Uh, and you can see how it has these fullers. And you can also see how wide the blade is compared to the original, which is now quite corroded, uh, mostly corroded away. But you can tell by how wide the, there's a slot in the in the hilt that shows you how wide the blade was. So then you can kind of extrapolate from that and get an idea of how, how wide the, the, what the original profile might have looked like. Um, there's the hilt of one of these, these anthropomorphic swords. Um, and this is a shield boss from, from the River Thames that's from this same period. And that's like, it, it's, a, it's about that big. Um, and it would have been on, on a larger shield. So then what happened was in the beginning of the common era, the Romans invaded Britain and set up, after, after a period of, of uh, conflict with the, with the Celts, they set up this incredibly uh, modern society with stone villas and cities and uh, you know, a mil basically military police force. They built roads. They, set up, they took tribal chieftains and set them up as, after the, after the Fuhrer had died down of invading, they, set, they took some of the people who were tribal chieftains or related to the, the ruling class and set them up as the leaders of, of areas and named the areas after the tribe. So this was this very complex society. And when you go and look at, um, if you go to the Museum of London, um, there actually are, they've, they've built the inside of a villa with all of the material and what it would have looked like. And it is remarkably similar to going to a house in the 1700s in Britain. So it's this almost modern society. Uh, the, they didn't have the same technology, but they had a lot of things like water wheels, and they were quite an advanced society. Um, but then the, the, after about 400 years the Roman of, of being in Britain, the Roman um, capital collapsed, and Rome fell apart, and the legions, who in, they, they left. 
And so we, we ended up having this sub-Roman culture, which was the people were Britannic. They were, they were kind of British Roman citizens. They could kind of considered themselves to be Romans. And this is what their material culture looked like. And you can see that this is, uh, this is part of uh, these bowls that we have little bits of the ornamentation. So this is what the ornamentation would have looked like in the time of Arthur uh, and Merlin and all of that. Um, so you can see it looks kind of like, it looks a bit provincial. It's, it's fairly crude. Um, and in some ways it's imitating Roman themes, but it also has some little barbaric flares. And if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see these spirals on the bottom of that buckle that are very similar to a kind of crude memory of the 10 period scroll work. Um, and that's another piece from sub-Roman Britain. And so around the time the Roman legions pulled out and the, the, this, this society on the left, that's Britain there. Um, and on the right, you'll see there's, there's Scandinavia and Denmark sticking up out of, out of northern Germany. And in northern, what's now northern Germany and Denmark, there were these Germanic tribes, the, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. And there is this kind of pressure of migrating tribes coming from the, from the east going west of this Germanic migration period. So everybody was moving west during this period. And the Anglo-Saxons, they, they ended up coming into Britain maybe as hired mercenaries, but they stayed and they settled in what is now England and pushed out, the, uh, pushed out or kind of subsumed the, the population that was there. Um, and they brought with them this vibrant uh, Germanic tribal uh, art with that, that hadn't been kind of crushed by having a Roman society imposed onto it. Um, and they came, this is after they'd been there for a while, that art combined with the craftsmen that existed there, these, these Br Br British craftsmen who may have had some memory of Latin style and definitely had, this, had ideas from Roman uh, ornamentation. And they, those craftsmen appear to have been working with Anglo-Saxon craftsmen and creating these, this kind of thing that was similar to the Germanic stuff that was happening on the continent, but different. So this is, a, this is the, the helmet from Sutton Hoo. Um, and you can see on the, on the front of it, it has these dancers. And these are very typical of the migration period. The, you'll find these images of these dancing. It's probably some kind of a warrior ritual dance. And it's probably where the idea of Vikings with horns on their helmets comes from, that they were, they were dancing with these kind of horned helms. Um, and this is the kind of house they lived in. And the thing that's fascinating about this is if you go from the Celtic roundhouse, which was a wooden structure with a thatched roof, then you had this incredibly complex society with stone buildings and roads and the, the floors of the buildings were inlaid with, with pictures and, and then that collapsed and we're back to a very similar society to the previous Celtic society uh, with these wooden houses. And this is what the Anglo-Saxon uh, stuff looked like. This is from a, the Staffordshire Horde, which was recently discovered. And you can see this cord work on the bottom piece. It's the beginning of knot work, which you'll, you'll see that evolves in Britain. And then on um, the top, you have gripping beasts, which are these kind of vibrant, frightening animals biting each other all around. This is a part of a sword. Um, and this is a, just, just to go back to that helmet with the dancing warriors. This is from the continent during a, the similar time. You can see the warrior with the, the horns on his head. And this is an Anglo-Saxon drinking horn. And you'll see, like this is all uh, knotworks built out of arms and legs, so it's all kind of dismembered body parts. It's very grim and 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 uh, very war warriorish, if that's a word. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about how that evolved in Britain. So this is this is the island of Britain, and what happened was the Anglo-Saxons converted to Christianity. The Celts, the Brit the Britons were already Christian. And so when that happened, you started having these um, uh, monasteries that were hiring local craftsmen to create uh, crosses and illustrated books. And they created this style called insular art, which is a, which is a marriage of, of Celtic and Roman and Anglo-Saxon. And that's what we now know today as Celtic art. So this is a cross from Nig, 
uh, in Scotland. And this is a beautiful example of insular art with the, the corded knotworks. You can see the beasts from th that refer to Anglo-Saxon ornamentation. And you can see the kind of circles and spiraling ornamentation from Le Ten period stuff. And these are sword mounts from uh, St. Ninian's Isle. These are silver sword mounts that a, a belt would loop through. And these are the chapes of uh, found. The chape is the piece that goes over the end of a scabbard on a sword that are just beautiful dragon heads or possibly platypus heads. We're not sure. <laughs> there may be some connection there. Um, and then the Vikings exploded out of Scandinavia. And they brought their very vibrant ornamentation tradition that has the same roots as Anglo-Saxon ornamentation that went into Britain and got mixed in until it became uh, insular ornamentation. Um, and insular ornamentation also went to Ireland and really flowered there. So Ireland had this, when, when, when these traditions distilled into Ireland, they really became beautiful. Um, so this is uh, Frank's casket from Dublin uh, in Ireland. And it's, uh, this is from the Viking period. The Vikings invaded, uh, I'm just going to go back one slide. The, the Vikings in, came out of Scandinavia and invaded northern England and northern Scotland and Ireland, and they settled there and set up cities and laws and stuff. Um, and so they brought their material culture with them. This is Frank's casket. It, it's all written in runes around, around it, and it combines Christian and pagan iconography. And on this, it, it has a riddle, that the answer to which is the material the box is made out of. I can't remember what the riddle is, but the, the answer is whalebone. So it's this beautiful riddle about, about what, that the answer is a whale to the riddle. So it's very kind of, you can see how Tolkien was inspired by that kind of uh, uh, Germanic riddling. Um, and here is the Ostenburg ship, which was just a beautiful example of, of uh, Viking Age ornamentation. On the prow of this ship is all dragons biting each other and gripping beasts. Um, and here is uh, the yelling stone in uh, from from Denmark, I think, right? Yeah. Um, and this is another example. And one of the things that's interesting about Viking that that's different about Viking ornamentation is it's more narrative than the the, the earlier stuff. Um, the 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 other stuff is much more ornamentation and then you have things in the viking age where they're taking the ornamentation and telling stories so they're kind of a little bit more pictographical um and, and you know like here you've got some kind of monster and there's a snake fighting with it and that so that that's typical of viking ornamentation and that was a thousand years ago and this is the kind of structure that they built this is a, a long house and this is the beginning of the the kind of beginning of the Middle Ages, and so here we have uh, the Vikings made these beautiful pattern molded swords uh, with inlays. Uh, they would inlay writing into them, um, and you can see the twisted center bars in there. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and there's some more pictures of these Viking swords that I'm very inspired by. And these are also a big part of the Viking storytelling was about swords and the the magic properties of swords. Um, and that, this is a sword from, from Ireland. Um, and this is a sword that's after they stopped doing powder molding so much. It's a more homogenous blade. But it might actually be an Ulfbert blade, I think. But, um, and here's a picture of a, of a blade with the powder molding in it. It's, it's rusted, so you can really see the structure of the pattern welding. Um, so these blades would have, when you moved the Viking sword in the light, it would have glistened, and you would have seen rippling lines going down the, the center of the blade. Uh, they would have been very, very beautiful weapons. Uh, this is the uh, dragon staff from Dublin. I think it might have belonged to an abbot or something, but I like to imagine that it was a wizard staff. <laughs> um, and then finally, at the end of the Viking Age, the Scandinavian the Scandinavians started adopting um, uh, feudalism and they became Christians and uh, they started making these incredible churches called the stave churches that were ornamented with this style called Ernest style uh, ornamentation and it's just like the height of, of this whole tradition of knotworks and I mean look at it it's amazing 
uh, you've got animals and serpents and plants and they all and this is a very very deep big carving so very inspiring stuff and then as feudalism set in and Europe became more homogenous that that tradition disappeared and they started imitating more southern European uh, styles of ornamentation um, but this is a church door uh, from Norway I think and it has the thing that's interesting about this is this has this this pagan pre-christian story about Sigurd the dragon slayer slaying Fafnir the dragon and Fafnir's brother who is a, a, a swordsmith helps Sigurd forge the blade of this broken sword that was given to his father by Odin so on, if you look at this doorway, you'll see it. They're, they're forging the sword on the bottom. They're doing something with the scabbard on the second one up. And the third one, they're, they're, he's killing the dragon. And then he kills the dragon and he, ha he cooks the heart. And the, the swordsmith is going to kill the, the dragon slayer. But when the dragon slayer tastes the juice of the heart, he knows he, he's given, gifted with mystical knowledge, and he knows the that the, the swordsmith is going to try to kill him, and he can hear the birds speaking, and so he kills the swordsmith on the top left of this. So that's this this pagan story on a church doorway. So that's the, that's the end of that that tradition. Uh, and that's the tradition of the stories and the mythology from that time period, which is a very big time period in a number of different cultures. Uh, it really inspires me. And uh, yes, and uh, Dave wants me to point out that as modern swordsmiths, we don't plan on killing our customers, which is very true. <laughs> um, so this is a piece from 2009. I'm just going to walk through a few of my pieces, and then I'm going to give you a, a, a run through of how I make a, a complete sword. Um, so th at this point, I was still drawing. Uh, now I draw my whole sword before I make it. At this point, I would draw the hilt in my sketchbook book and cut a hole where the hilt was and stick the blade in the sketchbook so I could see what the hilt might look like on the blade. Um, so these are some drawings inspired by uh, jewelry from, from the Viking Age. And my swords aren't imitations of specific swords. They're, I like to make swords as if I'm a swordsmith during the period. Um, so I'm taking inspiration from different knotworks and taking stealing knotworks from a brooch there, a stone there, and putting them um, on the scabbard to grip. Um, so I ended up using this design um, that you see on the on the grip on this sword, and there it is. Um, that's bog oak grip, and the the fittings are cast bronze, and the scabbard is is yellow birch. And that's a pattern molded blade. You can see the pattern in the steel uh, there. And this is the sword that I I made as a reconstruction of swords that. I examined with Peter Johnson and Owen Bush at the British Museum. So I contacted the British Museum and asked them if I could come and see their the, these swords. And after a number of emails, eventually was able to secure a, a date with some some really old ladies. <laughs> Um, and this was amazing. I mean, I, I had, as a teenager, you know, mystical imaginations about, about Celtic things and coming in and handling these swords was kind of, um, you know, a, a big letdown and a big, huge, amazing thing at the same time because they're just pieces of metal. There's, it's like an old rusty piece of metal. But then it's also this incredible 2,000-year-old object that was made by a craftsman that speaks essentially the same language of objects that I do. So I... We took these swords and traced them and took caliper measurements of them and drew the tried to, to I tried to draw pictures of the face on this one because the face is kind of worn away uh, and the one on the bottom right is this sword from from uh, possibly from Yorkshire which would have been the Brigantes tribe at the time um, that the sword existed and uh, I have a real love of Northern British Celtic. Uh, ancient Celtic society. So I really liked this sword. I like the way it looks, and I like it that it's a British sword. So I decided that I would try to do a reconstruction of it. Um, so I drew a picture, and I, I extrapolated from the, 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 the space that's left in, in the hilt from the original blade, and little places where there are still places where the blade comes down to an edge, even though it's rusted away a lot. Um, and the, the literature about this sword says it's about eight centimeters longer than it was. Um, so I, I took all of this information and put it together. And you can see in the center the, the width of the blades. Um, and then I took it and made, a, made, made my, my, my interpretation of that blade and made a grip uh, based on, on uh, photocopies of my drawing of the sword. Um, 
And so then I, I cast the grip in bronze, and there's the sword. Um, and there it is next to an image of the original. So you get this. Uh, and there's swords are very small. I'll show you a picture. of. There's a picture of the steel. I folded the steel up uh, to kind of imitate what, what the, the steel would have looked like. Although on the original, it would have probably not. It wouldn't have been etched. It would have just been bright steel. Um, but I'm making a contemporary sword, so I'm not that concerned about it being exactly like the historical piece. And that's how it is in comparison to a human. And it took a long time to get this picture right. Got, I got a lot of cuts on my hand. <laughs> uh, so there's a, then I made a wooden scabbard for it. This is the back of the scabbard, and the back of the head has the, the hair of the little man. Um, and there it is. And this, is, this scabbard design is inspired by Irish ornamentation. Um, because the, the, the Brigantes had connections with, with Eastern Ireland. So I pretended that they might have had a scabbard that was like the Irish scabbards. Um, so this is Willow Raven from 2010, Historical Inspiration and the Intuitive Process. Um, so when I'm, I've, I've gotten to go to the British Museum a couple times in the last few years, and I've uh, taken pictures of all these incredible pieces of, of swords. And this is the shape of a, a long knife. Uh, for, this is an Anglo-Saxon shape. Um, and I just thought that was really cool, dragon head with runes on it. So I, I needed to do something that was inspired by that. Uh, and then this is the, the lip of a drinking horn um, with faces on it. So, and there are these, these Viking swords with single edge blades that I, I think are kind of neat. So I made a pattern molded blade by forge welding steel together and twisting it. Um, and while I was doing that, I, when I was putting a bar in the forge, I burned my arm in this beautiful little willow leaf. So I decided, I mean, it's just, it's, I've still got it there, but it, this lovely little willow leaf. And the, the next day I was driving on the road and uh, there was a raven sitting on the side of the road. And so I stopped and got out and I walked over to it and picked it up. And it, it was, I, I even put it on my shoulder for a second and it kind of fell off. So it was, uh, I was very badly wounded uh, and took it back to my forge and I took it to the vet, but it, it died on the way to the vet. And it had been, it had been in a fight with like 40 crows trying to steal eggs. Um, but so I decided to name the sword Willow Raven after those two, those two events. Um, so there's the, uh, what I do is I carve the, the fittings in wax and then cast them into bronze. So there's my interpretation on the top and there's the, the original. And you can see that they're not, I'm not trying to do a reproduction of the original. I'm just inspired by it. Um, and then I decided that inspired by the idea of all the faces, I did the, the Norse pantheon around the, the top of the scabbard uh, throat. So there's Odin in the middle and uh, Freya and Thor. And on the back there's Loki and Tyr. Um, so then I, 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 make a, uh, I take the model and I put the, these little wax wires that the wax will, when I make a mold over that, the wax will melt out of those those spaces, and then I pour bronze into it, and I have a bronze object, which I now have to spend quite a bit of time fixing, cutting the little wires off, and uh, and uh, and polishing. And then I glue the hilt together, and this hilt was made. Actually, this is a neat story. Uh, Don Fogg, who's here today, gave me a piece of a Viking ship rib that was a, from a submerged Viking ship, and so this seemed like a good project to use that. So I made, I carved the grip on this out of a piece of wood that was originally from a Viking ship. Um, so that'll that'll confuse them in a couple hundred years. <laughs> uh, so then I take the I I, f I hammer the the tang goes through the handle. I hammer it down in, in in like a rivet head to hold the handle on, and the handle's also glued in place. And then I put the the pommel goes over and is riveted on with two little rivets. And there's your your finished piece. You can see the pattern molding in the blade. Um, and the carving on the scabbard, and there's Willow Raven or Witherhafen. Um, Helvegar. This is another single-edged Viking sword. Uh, I'm really interested in these these ring knots. Um, so I designed this sword with uh, the front of the sword has this scabbard slide that's an integral scabbard slide that your belt passes through and. I drew a picture of Odin inspired by some, some uh, Eastern Viking um, 
jewelry, and then I made his beard become his rings that drip. He has these rings that drip. Uh, eight, it's in one ring, and it drips eight rings every ninth night or something. So there he is with one eye, and I'm carving the carving him into the wood. Um, carved into the wood. I oiled the wood. Uh, this is a drawing of the 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 a scabbard mount that I carve in wax, cast into bronze. And this is the tip of the belt. It's a wolf head, and I cast that into bronze. Carve the grip. And there's the sword next to the drawing of the sword. And there's the scabbard mounts next yeah, in front of the scabbard. And there we are. That's the finished sword. And now this is a piece, this is a project I did with my father, who's a sculptor. Um, and I got to do some big knotwork carving. I've been fascinated with knotworks. Um, so I had, this was a project that lasted for quite a while, um, from the beginning of it to the end. So in 2007, I, I was commissioned to carve this big uh, archway over the, the portal out of, out of basswood. And then it was, a mold was made of it and cast into to two big bronze pieces. Uh, and this was inspired by Ernest Knotworks, but not an, an imitation of them. It needed to be something that was not a direct reference to history, but inspired by it. So it was like it represents a, an imaginary culture. Um, so and then I made mounts for these. There are standing stones that go around the piece. And so I carved uh, mounts for those and little brackets that go on the front of the, the piece. And there, are the, there it is cast in bronze, one of the, the mounts for a stone. And then uh, we installed it and drilled these, these brackets in place. And there's one of the brackets. And these are patinaed to look very old and uh, worn. And there it is. It's 14 feet tall, a huge portal. And there's the, the pillars that go along in each of the... All of the green stuff is, is the carvings that I did. Um, so that was neat, and it's in a, it's in a big city. It'll be a place that people walk when they go to the coffee shop, and behind it is a big uh, a big skyscraper that'll have people living in it. And uh, people, I'm not sure how how much people liked it. They're kind of looking at me strange when we were setting it up, but I think it'll be it's it's interesting to make something that people will see because when you make swords, the person who purchases the sword sees it, but not very many other people actually get to handle the piece. So there there it is. And then this is two ravens, or Tverhrafen. And this is, a, this is how, lately I've started drawing a full-scale drawing of a piece before I make it. And then I carve it. Um, and this piece has two ravens kind of embracing with their wings forming a lattice on the back of the handle and the tree on the handle that the roots wrap around. And there that, there it is. So this is the main... This is the main event. I have 15 minutes to show it to you. <laughs> uh, the Twisted Strand. Watch this. <laughs> uh, process design and imagination in creating myth-inspired pattern molded swords. So this is a, a sword that I made recently. And I'm going to walk you through the process of making it. Um, so this is a, a composite pattern molded blade. and. Um, the, the images that I'm showing you are of making four composite pattern molded blades, so there's a lot of, a lot of steel here. Um, this is a pile of, of billets that are, that are stacked up on the left. The, that pile is 13 layers of their bars stacked up on top of each other with two different uh, properties. There, some of the bars have <coughs> a little bit of nickel in them, and some of the bars don't. So when you forge weld them together and etch them, you'll still see a pattern in the material. And on the right, you have uh, nine layer billets. And I'm going to take them and I'm going to make something that looks like this. It's on the edge, you'll have uh, a billet that wraps all the way around. You see I put A at the top of that. And that's high layer. That'll be like over 600 layers. And in the center, I have nine layer bars that I've twisted. I'm just going to get a drink of water. Um, so I heat that up in the forge until it's yellow with glowing white edges. And then I forge weld it together and I have a, essentially a homogeneous piece of steel that all those bars are now one piece. Um, 
And then for the, the edge billet, I take that piece, I draw it out, and I cut it into five pieces and stack it up. And so you can see this is each of these pieces is about 13 layers. And I take that and heat it up in the forge and squish it in my hydraulic press to fuse it into one block of metal that now has like five times 13 layers. <laughs> Whatever that is. Something like, I'm not sure, 45? 65, something like that. <laughs> I probably should have wrote, written that down beforehand. <laughs> uh, so then I take that, I take this billet and I draw it out in my press. Uh, you can see I have my space my spaceman gear on here. Uh, I'm heating that up. I draw it out and I cut it up uh, with a with an angle grinder and I stack it. And now I have five billets that are five pieces all stacked up again. Uh, each of them is about 60 layers. Forge weld them together, and I have a bar, a, a chunk that's over 300 layers. Um, now I've been doing this. I did this with another billet, the same process. And I take that billet and I stack it on top of the original billet and forge weld that together. And now I have a over 600 layer billet. So there it is. Um, and then there are the nine layer billets and the, the over 600 layer billets. So now I take that and, and stretch it out on a hydraulic press. I use the hand hammer to straighten it. Um, and there it is halfway through being squished down. I'm drawing it out. It's longer. I'm, and here I'm straightening it because it gets twisted while you're forg forging it out. So keep it straight. And at the end of the day, if you look into the forge, you can see the dwarves <laughs> in the underworld forging swords um, sometimes. But I think that's when you know that you've been forging for too long. Uh, <laughs> carbon monoxide poisoning might be setting in. So then I take these billets. I draw them down to about, uh, I think, a half inch for this, this uh, project. Um, and I twist them. And I'm, t I'm taking, these are going to be... Uh, Pair, pairs of billets for each sword. I'm doing two billets in the center of each sword, and I twist them in the opposite direction from each other so that it will be a, a mirrored pattern um, in the center of the blade. There's a close-up of a twist, and there's my vise that I'm twisting them in. Uh, outside, it's snowy. This is in, in November when I'm doing this. So there are two the centers of two swords that I've got the billets twisted and roughly lined up. And then on this project, I decided that I would cut the tips of these, bu these billets at an angle and then forge the edge down so that the center was longer than the outside. And that way, uh, the, the lines, you'll see that there are going to be lines in this material, will form a nice little gothic arch at the tip of the blade, just behind where the edge material wraps around it, instead of just having lines going into uh, a rounded edge. So there, I've forged them around. Now I... Um, grind the surfaces that are going to meet so that they're clean and tie them together with iron wire. And this is the cores of four swords. I heat them up in the forge. Forge weld them together. And forge welding them is just heating them up and fusing them together by forcing them with a hammer or a press uh, to, to weld. And now I have one piece of metal with this beautiful pattern in, inside the material. Uh, and there's a, a picture of it. So here are the edge billets. So I've drawn these out so they're like, you know, at least three feet long. I'm not very tall. <laughs> so they're like, I don't know, six, over six feet long, in fact. <laughs> uh, and I grind the areas that are going to be t that I'm going to be welding. So I take all of the fire scale off that would would impede them from welding wrap that around the edge of this core billet that I've welded together. And now I have the situation that I was showing you earlier where I have the center billets with the twists in them and the pattern and the edge billet with the fairly homogeneous high layer metal. So heat that up in the forge and forge weld it together. And now I have a solid billet that has this pattern in the center and the, uh, this high layer pattern on the outside. So early in the morning, forging the profile into the blade and consolidating these welds to make sure that they're actually going to stick. And there I have the profiled uh, sword blade with the pattern in it. So the next thing I do is I grind away the extra material that I don't want uh, and and dip it in ferric chloride, which is an etchant that it, it's the, 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 the 
material that has a little bit of nickel in it resists that etchant, and the material with carbon turns black. So you can see the pattern here that's on the surface of the metal. It looks, looks pretty good. Icicles out the window, and there's five swords. The four on the left are the ones that I made from these, these billets. Uh, and the one on the far left is a big one with a 36 and a half inch blade, and that is the sword that I'm going to be focusing on. <clears throat> in the winter, I ski to my forge, um, and ravens sit on the tree outside the forge and fly away to go and steal food from my compost pile at my house because they know I'm not there anymore. Uh, so now I've got I've I've ground the bevels into the blade and I've ground fullers into the blade, and now I'm polishing them with I'm I'm filing them with, with and then uh, doing a, a rough polish before I harden the blade. Uh, with like 80 grit sandpaper and taking that you can see there are little scratches still in the center of the fuller So I'm taking those and, and polishing them out by rubbing them with sandpaper Now I make sure that the blade is is straight and I, I normalize it Which is where you heat it up to uh, a critical temperature and cool it down to, to basically relax the material and shrink the grains in the material in the steel um, and then I heat it up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit and quench it in, in warm oil. Uh, and there, when it comes out of the quenchant, the, the, you can see the pattern in the steel from the, decar the decarburization of the surface of the metal. It's quite beautiful and exciting. Because at this point, you're still not sure that the welds have all taken, and you've put quite a lot of time into this process. Uh, so this is an exciting day when you do a little anvil dance. <laughs> uh, so then you grind. Then I take it and I grind the I grind the edges down to to almost sharp um, at a low speed so that I don't heat up the metal. And then I I start polishing the blade, starting at 80 grit uh, with the, with the sandpaper glued to a piece of steel um, and rubbing it with a. I have a, a an iron heavy uh, half round thing that I I polish the the fullers with. And I bring it up to 250 grit and etch it to see the pattern. And now I'll, fin now I'll design the hilt and finish the blade um, and finish the f make the fittings for the blade. And I'll finish polishing it after I have everything done. Uh, but I like to I, I, I etch it because it makes me happy at this point to see that I'm actually making some progress with this piece. So I decided because I had this very long blade, I had extra material, so I made a 36-inch blade, which isn't they didn't have 36-inch blade blades in the Viking Age. Um, but I decided that I should make a, a dragon slayer sword that was long enough to slay a dragon. And there's a sword from Norway that I, I've always found very attractive. It's from the late Viking Age. And it looks like almost like a, a hand and a half sword. Uh, and it lo it's the type of sword that you can take that design and blow it up and make it uh, like a dragon slayer sword. So I, I, I started doing sketches of this sword and trying to imagine what a dragon would look like that you would need to uh, slay. And I started imagining... Maybe there's a culture that, like, you know, it's it's actually the Viking culture actually was the culture that won in in the the in in the historical battle between the the medieval feudalism and and the Viking Age, and uh, so I started making a, a high medieval Viking design for this sword um, and tried to imagine what a Viking warrior would look like uh, or, uh, that would slay a dragon. Like, how hard would you have to be? Uh, to think of looking into that eye right there, and uh, it could be terribly frightening. And if you had the wrong sword, you could get eaten. I mean, that's just what could happen, you know. Or with the right sword, it could be the dragon that didn't make it. Um, Sigurd hid in a hole and stabbed up. So he didn't actually have to really face the dragon when he, <laughs> the, the the primal dragon slayer. Um, or, you know, but the dragon could just be really big and scary and just burn you up. So your sword probably needs to be marked with runes and things to protect you from if the dragon has tentacles all over its belly and can just burn you and then grab you and eat you. So I designed uh, a sword. <laughs> did you like that? <laughs> I did that myself. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I designed this sword, and I've I've taken runes, and I started uh, I, I used dot runes, which are later medieval uh, runes, and I wrote them backwards to give the the incantations power. And I used I wrote the uh, I wrote the names of elements like breath, yeast, fire, and ice on the on the guard. And I decided that since this is a slightly more evolved Viking 
culture, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as um, profligate in the ornamentation, so I just used two motifs and repeated them. And these motifs are dragon hearts on the, on the grip. So, so you'll see that those repeat all through the design and, and on the scabbard. Um, so then I started making, I, I carved the handle, uh, the, the guard out of wax and fit it to the blade, carved the dragon hearts into the wax. Uh, marked it with runes, and uh, then I made the pommel, and the, there's a pommel to another sword in this image as well. And those are in wax. And then I made the, the grip out of um, wood that I collected from a forest that had been ravaged by dragon fire, so the sap was black. <laughs> and so this wood is perfect. You know, It probably gives you special properties when you hold it. Um, and then I made uh, little rings that go around the end of those little ferules with, with runes that have uh, references to, to the dragon mythology from like uh, Germanic uh, rune poems and things like that. Um, and then I made a mold of those, those objects and melted the wax out of them and I took bronze. And you can see from the left to right here there are chunks of bronze, they get hot, they melt, and they turn into glowing yellow liquid, which I take out of the furnace and on the in the foreground, you'll see that the the mold is is in a little in a little uh, vacuum chamber. So it's under pressure. So when you fill the hole, it sucks the molten bronze into the mold, and you have um, the the space that was inhabited by the wax is now inhabited by liquid bronze. And after it cools, you break the mold away, and you have uh, a bronze object exactly the same shape as the wax model that you put into it. So there's the pommel. I take the, I cut off the the sprues and polish it and and uh, darken it using ferric chloride. Um, and there's the grip with the ferules in place. Uh, the blade is I've now polished it to 600 grit and uh, done a final etch and then I've given it a final temper. Um, and now I'm fitting, all of these fittings need to be filed and minutely adjusted to fit onto the, the tang of the sword. Now I'm carving a scabbard, and the scabbard is lined with sheep fleece that's been sheared close so that you can, when you put the blade in it, it can be oiled by the, the sheep fleece. Uh, and there's the, this is the scabbard slide uh, on the front of the scabbard where a belt goes through. And... Um, there's the tip of the scabbard with the dragon heart again. Uh, and there, the finished sword next to the drawing of the sword. And uh, there's a close-up of the, the blade. You can see the fine pattern on the edge material that's from the 600 layers um, and the black wood. There's the tip of the blade, and you can see how the little cathedral window shape at the tip where I, where I forge welded those two things to make a little gothic arch and how the material wraps around the tip. And there's the finished sword, and I decided to name it Dagfinner, Dayfinder. Um, and the length of the whole sword is 44, it's almost 45 inches long. And there's a close-up of the hilt. And there, there I am holding it to give you an idea of the size of it. So it's a good, a good size sword for, for slaying a dragon. And uh, thank you very much for, for uh, coming and listening to me blather on about my swords. <laughs> Wow, right? I mean, I know, right? Wow. That was really cool. Thank you very yeah, much, Jake. It's, thanks a lot. It's an honor to have you in my forge. Right uh, this is really great. Um, okay, guys, coming up next, we have a special video greeting from a good friend of ours from the forum, Petter Florianic. Florianic. <laughs> Hi, Petter. <laughs> Hi, Petter. <laughs> uh, thanks. And uh, coming up after the, the break, uh, we have J. Arthur Luce uh, demonstrating Niello. It's a very fascinating technique. You're going to want to tune in and check that out. And there's fire involved. So, <laughs> see you then.